Hi everyone, I'm Amy French, also known as the Roaming Historian. I'm a history professor who loves to travel around the world, especially Italy, um, and uh, visit historical sites and places where of great culture. And today uh, for my blog, I'll be talking about the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, Italy, especially featuring one of my favorite artists, Sandro Botticelli. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to show you guys uh, my, uh, my video here so that you guys can see what I, pictures I took. So just one second, there we go, there they are. And there is, this is the interior of the Uffizi. And so the Uffizi, Uffizi uh, means offices, offices in Italian. And so these were the offices of the Medici. And the Medici family, they were great patrons they are. Um, Michelangelo even lived with the family at one point. And San, Sandro Botticelli, Botticelli uh, was a family friend. Uh, many other artists were close to various Medici rulers, including like uh, uh, Donatello and uh, Giorgio Vasari. And so over time, the Medici accumulated vast amounts of art they passed down from generation to generation. The building here was designed by Giorgio Vasari at the request of Grand Duke Cosimo de' Medici. Um, and as I said, uh, it originally served as the offices of the administrative and judicial offices of the Duchy of uh, Tuscany. Um, Vasari also built a corridor up here. <laughs> and so there is over here, if we were, so we're facing right now, if we're facing, we're facing the river. Um, the river is the Arno River, and it runs through Florence and all the way to Pisa and uh, throughout, uh, you know, a good deal of Tuscany then. And there is a bridge here uh, to the right of, if we, were, if we were saying there, this is the, called the Ponte Vecchio, the old bridge, and maybe I'll do a blog on that someday. And over here on the other side of the river was the Palazzo Pitti, and that is where the Medici, by this point, by the time of Cosimo, um, Cosimo not Cosimo the Elder, there's two Cosimo de' Medici that are very important in history. Uh, not the first Cosimo, <laughs> the second one. And, uh, and so he, um, he and his, uh, his family, they're in danger constantly of being assassinated. So Vasari built a passageway that would connect them to their offices here, um, to the, the Palazzo Pitti. Um, allegedly, this is supposed to open to the public in maybe, I don't know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, Francesco, the Cosimo the first son, converted the upper floor here of the gallery into, or of the, of the offices into a gallery. And so uh, this would hold part of his vast collection of statuary, paintings, and other art. And thanks to the forethought of Anna Maria Luisa de' Medici, so Anna Maria Luisa de' Medici, she was the last member of the royal line of the House of Medici, she bequeathed all of the Medici art. The vast collection was to be left to the city and the people of Florence. And so that makes this the most, to me, it's the most amazing city in the world because it's just the most amazing place to see tons of art up close, probably more than anywhere else. Um, and uh, officially the PC Gallery then opened in, let's see, here we go. Uh, the PC Gallery opened in 1765, but it has been showing um, its holdings to its visitors on request since the late 1500s. Millions travel um, every year to here. Uh, this is the courtyard. We're seeing it from a different vantage point. Um, and here you can see in these niches, there's statues. And so here's one of Donatello. Um, and they're just illustrious artists and politicians, scientists, and other greats. You know, they, you can wander around, you can visit Michelangelo or, or Galileo or Machiavelli or Dante or all sorts of people. Um, I love when I walk in. <laughs> Here's how much I love this place. I love this place enough that I have an annual pass, even though I'm an American that lives in Michigan. <laughs> and, but what it does is it gives me skip the line access and you absolutely need this. This is not like an American or um, a lot of museums that you'll have find in North America where you really can get same day service. You really need to make a reservation or buy your tickets in advance um, so that you don't wait. And um, if we went back, if so you don't wait, here and uh, what is usually a humongous line here. If we were looking down this corridor, we would see a humongous line of people waiting. Um, and so um, I, you know, I go there and I always come up. You come up these grand stairs, and then there's always this little dog at the top. <laughs> and I love this dog. This dog is right before. So you get your ticket, and then your your ticket, uh, the ticket collector will check your ticket before you enter into what is really a U-shaped. Um, place. 
Um, at the end of one of the use here, this is uh, uh, Leakawan, it's a copy of Le Leakawan, the original is in the Vatican. Um, the building itself is beauty incarnate. I mean, it is just gorgeous. Always be sure to look up when you're there. Look at the different rooms, you know, this is uh, Buntalenti's tribute. And you can just peek into it. You can't actually go into this room, but you can see um, what the uh, Buontalenti, a great architect and, and uh, in his own right, an artist in his own right, um, had designed to show off some of the, the most fabulous of the treasures. Um, and here, so one of the hallways, and you can see how beautifully frescoed the ceilings are. Um, here's another one. And once again, you know, and all the rooms are kind of off, so it's very easy. Um, I find it to be a manageable museum. It doesn't exhaust me, and it's easy to navigate. Um, you, you come out, once you enter up the stairs, you just kind of wander around the U, and then there's a wonderful little uh, place, a little terrace, a little terrazzo, where you can have some coffee if you'd like. You can see the Palazzo Vecchio next door. You can get a nice view of Florence. And then you go downstairs, and then there's more. Um, gal more galleries to look through, but each room will, will take you through. Um, today, though, we, I want to focus on one of my favorites, right? My favorite artist is Sandro Botticelli. Um, and uh, Sandro lived from 1454, 1445 to 1510. This is uh, his, he was born in Florence on Borgo Ognissanti, All Saints Ognissanti. Um, he's buried in the church there, Chiesa di Ognissanti. Um, and some of his works are actually in situ there. So you can go to Ognissanti, Sanzi, which I highly recommend doing it because it has amazing fresco by Ghirlandaio um, of the Last Supper. Um, just fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Um, you can see his tomb there. Um, later, his family moved over to uh, Via Nuova, uh, which today is uh, Via della Porcellana, uh, where their neighbors were the Vespucci. And um, I think a lot of Americans were familiar with Amerigo Vespucci, um, who uh, makes this voyage over to America, right? And, and hence giving it the name. Um, and uh, Simonetta Vespucci was married to another Vespucci. And she's rumored as to be the muse uh, for his Venus. And here's Simonetta. This is a, a portrait of her done by Piero di Cosimo. Um, Botticelli was apprenticed to Fra Filip Filippo Lippi, um, and he became a well known artist. And so, uh, even working on the Sistine Chapel. And so you can see his works there today. Um, I'm just going to focus on a few of the, I mean, there's the, the Uffizi has a huge collection of his work. I'm just going to focus on a few of my favorites. Um, on the right here, this is two. Uh, this is the discovery of the body uh, of, uh, the, well, the, the, really the beheaded body of Holofernes and the return of Judith to Bethulia. And this is about 1472. And so, uh, this is a biblical tale of Judith who uh, had beheaded an important Assyrian general because of his treatment of her people. And so Botticelli shows her here and her maid. Um, and her maid, if you look up, can you see out there? Can you see that's, that's Holofernes head. <laughs> that's his beheaded head. Um, and so um, he shows Judith and her maid re returning uh, with Judith holding an olive branch in one hand here as a sign of peace. And she's bringing that to the Hebrews. Um, another really famous one, there's, there's a little bit more up close, you can kind of see the details. And there you can see Holofernes had better. Uh, Primavera, springtime. Oh, I love this one. Um, just gorgeous, just gorgeous, gorgeous. It shows um, different figures from classical mythology. Um, and the foreground to the right is a Zephyr. He's embracing a nymph Chloris. Um, um, before he's actually taking her. Um, uh, and so, um, and then there's, a, uh, she's transformed into Flora, the, the spring goddess. Um, the center is dominated by Venus, the goddess of love and beauty, um, who is actually rather chastely dressed um, uh, compared to the next one we're gonna see. Um, and uh, you have a little blindfolded Cupid firing his arrow of love. And on the left, you have the three graces. They're dancing in a circle. And then um, Mercury, the messengers of the gods, um, is there. And so it's, it's this celebration of love and peace and prosperity. And, and we see the full bloom, you know, the flowers in bloom. And, and it's spring, right? And it's renewal and rebirth. Um, here's the birth of Venus, another major favorite of mine. Um, circa 1485, this shows the goddess of love and beauty again, 
Um, although not as demurely dressed as she was in the previous painting. Uh, she is uh, arriving on land. She's born of a sea spray and blown there by the winds. And so you can see the winds blowing her there. Um, and she's standing on a giant scallop shell. Um, and so a woman in the background there is holding out a cloak of flowers to her and roses are being blown about and, uh, and her nudity then is covered by her long blonde hair. Um, the second to the last one is uh, that I'm going to show you is Madonna the Pomegranate, 1487. And so we see the, this is the Virgin Mary. She's center of the composition um, together with the Christ child and they're surrounded by six beautiful angels. And the pomegranate is both a symbol of fertility and also an allusion to the past passion of the Christ because of the blood colored seeds. And then lastly, my last uh, of my favorites is the Annunciation. Uh, and the Annunciation is where the Virgin Mary is going to get a pronouncement from the Archangel Gabriel that she is going to give, uh, to give birth to the Christ child. Um, it's set in a Renaissance palace, as you can see. It's overlooking a walled garden here in the back, and that's supposed to symbolize Mary's purity. The portico through which the um, angel appears leads into Mary's room. So we can see things too. We can see a tall wooden bed. We can see it surrounded by chests. And it gives this idea about fashions and interior design for wealthy of the area during the Renaissance. And, uh, you know, these are just a few of the many Renaissance greats. I think, you know, in future editions, maybe I'll talk to you about some of the other favorite, because this is by far not the, 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 my favorites there. These are just, I, you know, win a, winnowed a few down to one guy. Um, and so um, thanks for, for uh, joining me today, and I hope you have a great day, and I hope you someday you get to see these in person yourself. Happy travels. Oh, there's Mary again. <laughs> have a great day.